being serious on the digitalization of the smart energy systems. So this is the, today we have this uh, third part. Well, that's an activity that is organized of three European projects, the IRIGRID uh, 2 project, the Synergy project, uh, as well as the uh, Resiliate project. Uh, from uh, the, uh, the speakers are from the Austrian Institute of Technology, AIT, including myself and Thomas uh, Schlasser from the AIT. Um, senior scientist there and also the coordinator of the IRIGRID 2 project uh, together with uh, my colleague Philip today. We are uh, giving you an update uh, about validation and testing uh, in general. Uh, but before we come to that, uh, please ask the question. I put it already in the in the chat. Um, uh, ask the question via the chat. Um, you are muted. Uh, you cannot show your webcam. Uh, it's mainly me and Philip. Uh, and feel free uh, to ask the questions during uh, our talks. Uh, uh, we will uh, have a look. Uh, we monitor in the chat uh, and in case. Uh, yeah, and we are trying to answer all the questions that uh, pop up uh, during uh, our talk. And we have also time, hopefully at the end, uh, to answer additional ones if uh, some appear. Uh, as said, we are recording uh, the, uh, the lectures uh, series also today. Uh, and uh, we will share the recordings together with the slides uh, to all of you. You will receive a uh, separate email uh, by the most probably by the end of the week with all the material uh, together. Uh, as said, uh, this uh, event uh, uh, training series uh, is organized by the three European projects, uh, uh, Irrigate Synergy and OECD8. Um, funded mainly by the European Commission uh, Horizon 2020 program, uh, but also the smart energy systems, uh, Aeronet, especially the OCD8 uh, uh, project. We had already two lectures, uh, Monday and Tuesday this week, uh, uh, linked uh, with modeling and simulation of integrated energy systems, as well as integrated energy services, uh, service security issues and analytical services. And today we will have a closer look uh, at the designing and the validating of cyber physical energy systems. Um, that go, uh, goes uh, more towards uh, uh, implementation, testing, realization, uh, and, uh, compared to the first two uh, lectures uh, this week, uh, the first two parts, and the uh, final lecture uh, tomorrow that uh, is uh, tightly linked also with the uh, uh, topics that we are uh, tackling today. Tomorrow, our colleagues. Uh, Katalin Gavrilut and Dennis Vettoretti uh, will talk about the five cyber physical uh, test beds for the validation of large scale smart grid applications. So, this is the short introduction. Let's uh, switch to the uh, lecture part, to the third lecture part now. Uh, and I think we can, uh, we can start. So, the uh, idea of today's lecture is to have a look uh, or to tell you what uh, we have done in, especially in the Irrigate 2 project and in the RECD8 uh, project on the design and validation of cyber physical energy systems. Some works are also uh, have been carried out in other projects, but these are the main contributors yeah, to this, uh, to the, to the content uh, today. Uh, we have, uh, Philip and I, uh, maybe Philip uh, introduce uh, briefly yourself <laughs> before we start. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Yes, my name is Philip Pressel and uh, I'm the coordinator of the Resilient Project. And uh, I've been working at AIT for quite some time there. It, I'm a scientist there. Uh, I've been working a lot with uh, uh, designing, but uh, I would say mainly validating energy systems, uh, moving from classical energy systems towards cyber physical energy systems. So I would say this talk today is a combination of uh, years scattered experience from Thomas and me, so it'd be nice to, to share this with you today. Thanks, Philip. Uh, and let's come to the contents. So we have uh, structured the talk today into uh, four main uh, uh, parts. So we, so we start with the first uh, uh, introduction and we want to outline uh, why it's necessary to work on all the uh, the content that we are uh, telling you or that we are presenting to you during uh, today's lecture. Uh, this is about uh, linked with the higher complexity in cyber physical energy systems. Uh, then uh, we uh, outline what are existing problems, needs, and research trends before we 
focus on the main part that is related to the methods for test preparation. So before you do any testing validation work, uh, the idea is here to, or to have tools and methods in hand that helps you to, to prepare the tests, uh, the validation setups, uh, the test setups, uh, and then perform uh, the validation. Uh, itself, the testing, uh, which is uh, then uh, presented uh, afterwards, the advanced validation and testing methods, always in context uh, of uh, cyber-physical uh, energy systems. Let's uh, go to the first part. Uh, so uh, we discovered a high complexity in uh, cyber-physical energy systems. What do we understand uh, by this term or uh, this area? So if we look at the, uh, at the uh, Power and energy system in general. Here, uh, Philip and I, we have a, 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 a big focus, a core focus on the electric power system. This is the direction where we're coming from, where our uh, uh, unit uh, uh, is working on. Uh, so we uh, we have uh, to deal with the large scale integration of renewable energy sources. And you see that uh, worldwide, that there's a big trend, uh, more and more uh, distributed energy resources are being installed uh, in the grids that uh, uh, put also partly a uh, huge pressure on the uh, uh, network planning uh, and operation of the uh, of the infrastructure of the grid itself. Uh, on the other side, we see also here uh, developments uh, also on the uh, on the load side, on the consumer side, uh, more and more. Uh, so they're going towards a higher degree of electrification. Uh, that we see also on the on the consumer side, on the load side, is uh, uh, home storage systems, battery systems, uh, electric vehicle supply equipment, uh, heat pumps, and so on. This is definitely a clear trend uh, that we discover. That brings definitely more uh, complexity from the infrastructure point of view, but also as uh, outlined from uh, the planning design, uh, but also from the validation point of view. Uh, besides that, there are clear trends uh, towards uh, the integration of uh, new energy solutions. Uh, energy communities is an interesting concept that gets more popular. Market uh, structures are adapting or changing partly. Uh, then uh, there's an also an important uh, uh, trend. Uh, uh, we should not have a, a, a look, a single look at one specific domain as for uh, Example on uh, the power system domain, we should also look what's going on, uh, on in other linked uh, energy areas. So sector coupling uh, is an important uh, concept as well. So to have a more holistic view on the overall energy systems, not only on the power system itself. But for sure, we our understanding is that the power system, uh, the electric power system, is will uh, is already and uh, will more and more be the the core uh, backbone of the overall um, infra, uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, so also for those that attended the event on uh, Monday, uh, where our colleague uh, Edmund Beadle uh, uh, introduced the co-simulation of. Um, um, sector coupled uh, energy systems uh, uh, given uh, or provide some examples uh, related to the uh, uh, joint analysis of the electric power system together with a heat uh, network. And uh, one of the enablers uh, besides a couple of others uh, is definitely also uh, the digitalization. So it's a key enabler that uh, helps us to better understand what's going on uh, in the overall uh, energy infrastructure and uh, helps us also in the uh, planning and the operation of them. And here we, uh, we say that cyber-physical energy systems uh, hardly outlined here, uh, so a sector coupled uh, systems, lots of ICT uh, is here definitely uh, uh, a way uh, for uh, to, to cope with uh, the higher complexity. So cyber physical, uh, cyber, uh, physical energy system is a physical system that uh, is tightly interacting with the ICT systems uh, and they cannot uh, longer be uh, uh, looked and analyzed and developed and validated uh, in a uh, isolated manner. So they need to be uh, tackled or looked at uh, in a holistic uh, view. And you can imagine that here, uh, that we have here a uh, much higher complexity. Uh, this, this are uh, uh, lots of drivers, but we always need to look from uh, different angles to the overall uh, problem. So we have a system view, a technology view, and 
uh, for sure also a market related view. Um, so from the system, as already outlined, we have the, uh, uh, the electrification um, of the mobility, for ex example, we have to deal with aging infrastructure, distributed generation, uh, renewables, the stochastic behavior of the renewables and so on. Urbanization is also a big trend. Uh, um, on the other side, we have a lot of technology advancements, uh, especially on the uh, power electronic side, communication automation, um, storage system, energy storage systems, uh, uh, the generation side itself, the distributed uh, generators. Uh, there were lots of uh, really uh, good developments happening over the last uh, uh, two decades, I would say. And uh, especially here in, in Europe, we are also dealing with the liberalization and deregulation of the uh, of the energy systems. So the uh, typically the uh, energy supply is deregulated. So we have here uh, energy markets, but the infrastructure is still uh, regulated, which makes sense. It's, uh, it's a clear uh, a trend also that started more than well, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Around. Uh, so that needs to be tackled uh, or keep kept also in mind. Uh, the big question at the end is uh, there are lots of uh, interesting and very useful uh, developments uh, and we have this uh, the key elements uh, we try to summarize them with the advanced communication automation and control systems so as digitalization of the energy system power electronics uh, the smart algorithms so, uh, uh, and approaches so uh, artificial intelligence machine learning become more and more important as well uh, in in our area uh, Monitoring data analytics is, is definitely uh, important to uh, better understand what's going on in such a more uh, sector coupled system. Um, uh, and uh, at the end, uh, we need to think how to design and validate such a system. Uh, we cannot uh, do a, a big analysis uh, and uh, uh, developments and then uh, we deployed uh, to the to the field probably that works in in such areas in such uh, uh, yeah uh, countries uh, where the uh, degree of electrification uh, or the uh, infrastructure development is not so uh, far advanced here especially in Europe uh, in Central Europe or in Europe in general we have a, uh, a well elevated uh, energy infrastructure, especially also on the electric uh, power system side. And uh, so we need to uh, to look, uh, this is our, how we can uh, further evolve it, uh, especially uh, towards uh, decarbonization uh, and the integration uh, or, uh, with uh, or powering, uh, or generating the, uh, the electricity uh, this much more renewables uh, integrated. Uh, so this, this are the, uh, lots of challenges that we have to deal with. And uh, we discovered in the past that uh, um, different domains also in the electric power system uh, area uh, were often uh, analyzed uh, independently. So the grid, uh, the, uh, the generators, the ICT system are not so tightly uh, coupled. And lots of uh, planning, uh, engineering, design, validation step has been carried out uh, manually. That uh, uh, yeah, um, provides room, let's say in that uh, way, provides room for improvement. And uh, we want to uh, give you some insights about our work, uh, how especially the design and uh, focuses more uh, on the validation side, also testing validation side can be improved with uh, corresponding methods, procedures, tools. Uh, uh, and at the end, uh, the goal is to, to look at, uh, towards a more uh, automated, uh, probably not fully automated, but uh, automated or, or tool supported uh, design and uh, validation uh, of the energy systems. But before we come to the uh, to the details, uh, just a few uh, more details. Uh, so um, usually we want uh, what the, the drivers for our research work. Uh, so we, are, um, we want to reduce the manual steps between the different um, specification design, uh, validation and uh, rollout phases here in the in the figure below. Uh, it's very simple. Indeed, uh, in reality, it's, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, Philip uh, reflected also uh, later on in his part. Uh, but it, it briefly outlines that we usually start uh, when we introduce uh, a new uh, solution, uh, uh, for example, an energy management system. So 
usually we start with specifications. Uh, there we uh, I show you later on some uh, very briefly some some tools that can be used. Then we typically uh, develop the uh, the energy management algorithms. We add, uh, need to uh, to early validate them and then to co code uh, and implement them uh, in the related. Uh, uh, automation uh, computing devices, it can be SCADA systems, it can be remote terminal units, it can be edge devices, whatever is, is, is necessary for a specific application. Uh, we uh, assume that under the uh, engineering part. Uh, then uh, typically uh, you do different tests, factor acceptance test, uh, system or site acceptance tests uh, between the, uh, the deployment. It's a uh, lots of, of steps, uh, and this is very uh, briefly uh, spoken. Uh, the, the overall process is a bit more complicated, uh, and uh, it's not so linear as it's uh, shown here. Here with this uh, circles, feedback circles, it uh, indicates that uh, it can be a, a force and back. <laughs> Sometimes you need to go back to specification adapter. Probably it's not always the case, uh, but yeah, doing engineering, uh, testing, validation, um, you have uh, lots of uh, uh, usually feedback loops. This is an uh, uh, ideal case, and uh, on the other side, we need to to tackle or deal with uh, lots of other uh, things. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, to deal with uh, correctness, uh, with readiness, uh, scalability, but also we need to uh, to uh, inc uh, include the new developments with legacy systems. So we need also to to look uh, uh, towards backwards compatibility. So there are lots of of uh, other uh, typically often referred to as. Uh, um, um, I'm missing the term um, uh, non-functional requirements. So we have to deal with functional, but also with non-functional requirements. Uh, so they, they, they need to keep uh, in mind. Uh, very briefly, uh, for these uh, three main uh, uh, say, four, three to four um, uh, steps from the specification, uh, engineering design, validation, testing, towards rollout. A few um, uh, approaches that you might uh, know, especially in the uh, uh, in the specification uh, case, uh, there's an uh, IEC standard called 62559 about use case uh, engineering. It helps you to, uh, it's a structured process for the specification of uh, related applications uh, and requirements and needs. Uh, the uh, uh, standards uh, pr proposes here um, an uh, uh, engineering approach, uh, guidelines starting from business cases, uh, deriving the use cases, the detail, the user requirements, and the technical specifications at the end with the related uh, uh, use case templates. So that's very helpful, especially when it's a uh, uh, when you uh, need to think uh, uh, in a structured and uh, detailed way about the, the specification, the requirements uh, of your um, uh, energy application. Linked with that, uh, there is also very helpful the so-called smart grid architecture model that uh, supports the specification of the smart grid applications. Uh, and it provides uh, a structured process linking the use case into the system architecture. So this is this uh, SGAM uh, cube uh, that uh, also focuses deeply on uh, lots of interoperability uh, needs uh, between the different interoperability layers uh, from the component uh, towards the business layers in between you have the communication, the information and the functional layer. And also uh, here uh, this process uh, is outlined uh, that uh, links these uh, use cases uh, to the different uh, layers and uh, uh, here you can uh, derive more details uh, for your specification. Uh, in the next step, uh, this is a work that uh, was uh, uh, done and suggested by, by Philip. He will uh, come back to that later on. Uh, uh, we call it the power system automation language. This is a model based engineering approach. Uh, the idea uh, uh, is based on the uh, on some approaches that coming from other domains, uh, from the uh, computer science domain, where model driven engineering uh, is uh, widely used. Uh, you, um, model your software, software requirements, and then later on the software uh, on high uh, with higher level um, uh, modeling languages. 
So you're not coding uh, directly uh, the application, you're modeling the application, uh, and then uh, with the uh, corresponding uh, uh, um, tools, uh, they are referred to um, uh, case tools, computer aided software engineering, uh, you can uh, derive the code out of it. Um, the uh, unified modeling language uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, way uh, often used for that and we adopted uh, this general idea uh, for uh, the uh, domain of power and energy systems where uh, the power system automation language uh, is a kind of a formal language uh, it's uh, outlined in the next uh, slide that helps you to um, um, describe your use cases uh, in an engineering uh, step uh, uh, more uh, in a formal way uh, in the uh, different ESCOM layers. They are shown here, the business functional layers, the information communication and the component layer, uh, where uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, there are two main parts uh, for the specification. The first one is the description of the so-called application. So let's link to the uh, uh, with a specific, oh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, that describes the, uh, the, uh, Automation application, the energy application, um, very briefly outlined. This is one step uh, to take uh, with you. And the other step uh, is, uh, or the other stage is to link that application uh, to the uh, execution system and the communication system. So at the end, uh, the application, so it's, uh, it's, for example, an energy management application, it needs to interact uh, with the physical uh, system, uh, with the power system uh, and the ICT system. Uh, and that uh, is also described here in a, with a formal uh, language um, where you can then uh, move your or transform, transform your use case description uh, into this uh, formal uh, high level modeling language that has these two main uh, parts the application part and the we call it the system. Uh, and uh, uh, it's also shown by Philip later on. Um, there are lots, or we have de uh, developed tools that helps you to uh, start from a specification phase uh, to define uh, or identify your uh, energy application uh, use cases uh, and environments. And then, uh, uh, if you do it in a uh, formal way, for example, we start using uh, ML related tools. There exist possibilities to transform or to semi-automatically transform uh, the uh, use cases requirements uh, in uh, PSAL uh, language or PSAL uh, style language, uh, and later on also to derive validation and testing uh, needs and testing setups. But this will come uh, later on. This is just a very briefly outline. Good, and uh, finally also, um, especially when it's a more complex, um, uh, energy system or cyber physical energy system or special uh, application. Uh, then you need to think also how you validate it. Um, um, we have seen uh, uh, an approach uh, that was uh, given, uh, or, um, that was introduced by Edmund uh, Wittel on uh, Monday this week, uh, where he uh, explained the co-simulation uh, of uh, of um, uh, applications that can be used for the for for the. For the development uh, of the uh, algorithms uh, and later on you need to uh, bring them also to, to uh, or transform it to code uh, to show you how that can be for example done with our approaches our developments and in the last step also to think how the uh, uh, the validation needs to be carried out uh, usually you have uh, this is an outcome of the uh, Eritrea 1 project. It was a previous project before we started Eritrea 2. We continued and we uh, uh, improved the methodology. Um, uh, we called it uh, we called it the overall uh, approach holistic testing. Uh, the basic idea is uh, outlined here. It's a seven-step process where we start on the first hand side. This is stage one, the scenario description. So here you describe the needs, the validation and testing needs. Uh, on the other side, you need to look what kind of uh, testing uh, possibilities you have. Uh, so, for example, cost simulation is outlined by, by uh, Edmund on Monday. Philip will uh, show us uh, how uh, hard in the loop. Uh, uh, um, the hard in the loop uh, concept can be also uh, used, or maybe you use uh, um, uh, hardware testing, uh, lab-based uh, testing. Um, 
And then you need to align uh, the, the, the test requirements with the testing possibilities. Uh, then uh, later on, you can specify the fourth step, uh, the uh, experiments to specify the experiments, implement the experiments, do the analysis of the outcomes of the testing validation phase. Uh, maybe you need to go back. Um, and then uh, if you're satisfied with the results, you need to document the results. There was one qu uh, question in the chat. What is the difference between the P-cell model? I want to uh, answer that before we move on. And the SCAM, so the SCAM is the smart grid architecture model that uh, has been defined in order to, to uh, uh, develop uh, smart grid applications to also to define or to um, out um, uh, Going back to identify loopholes in development, especially also standardization. So it's a formal process uh, that is uh, uh, linked with the specification phase. And the PSAL builds on that uh, and provides a formal uh, modeling language for it. Let's say it in that way. Philip will give us an example later on. So they um, complement each other because uh, SCAM. Uh, there was uh, no suggestion made how you describe the different uh, use cases on the different um, interoperability layers. So the idea here with the PSAL is to have here a formal uh, language also for doing that. It can be uh, uh, partly automated uh, in corresponding uh, software tools. I hope that explains uh, the question. Good. And now uh, let's come to the core part of our uh, lecture today. So this was more or less the introduction and a bit the uh, uh, background. Uh, and, um, now uh, I want to uh, give you some um, hints how a test preparation can be carried out or what in our point of view is necessary. So I will um, explain especially these steps and the, uh, the related tools that we have developed this holistic testing uh, approach for smart grid systems uh, in more detail. And Philip uh, will then uh, give us more details about the different tools, uh, uh, including uh, uh, the PSAL and the SCAM, how you come from a specification to the uh, um, uh, generation part or semi-automatic generation of uh, code, code fragments, and then later on uh, also the testing of that in a cyber-physical uh, system, cyber-physical energy system. Good. Uh, let's start uh, with a motivating example um, uh, uh, of this uh, test preparation. So uh, let's assume here uh, uh, we took uh, this uh, voltage control or can be also other type of, uh, of application, but here's a, a small voltage control example shown in a Power distribution grid uh, with distributed energy resources, uh, PV system, for example, uh, an uh, historic system, electric vehicle supply equipment, uh, smart transformers, um, which uh, uh, have, uh, have the three main components the communication interface, the control algorithms, uh, and the uh, power electronic part. Uh, here we have also outlined or well, indicated that we have here a tap changing transformer, an onload tap changing transformer, uh, a communication system that links the different um, um, power system uh, and ICT uh, elements together. We are not uh, seeing here or referring to a specific communication network, but there is communication available. Uh, protocols can be, can be used to Sure, 650 plates in, in that area, important role. And then uh, an optimization control. This can be the, uh, the voltage control, can be an energy management or any other type of uh, application. Uh, so we have here a cyber physical energy system or some cyber physical power system. Uh, uh, physical part, uh, the uh, ICT part, and um, we need to validate uh, the optimization control. So the big question here is, uh, well, what we discovered uh, in lots of projects is that uh, many uh, domains are involved. So we need here holism. So at least we have the power system uh, domain. We have ICT, uh, 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 control, uh, or control applications are being executed. Uh, so we have at least uh, two different uh, areas, domains, where the uh, uh, developers uh, need to work together. 
Uh, and uh, what we also discovered, uh, especially uh, in uh, projects like Irigrid 2, Irigrid 1, and uh, previous projects where we off, uh, offered access to our research infrastructure laboratories uh, uh, for external uh, engineers and researchers, uh, that uh, on the one hand side, experiments are often uh, hardly reprodu reproducible to different procedures, setups, and uh, uh, internally in every lab. Uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, research infrastructure capability, lab capability are often limited. So one lab can do a specific uh, a test or a specific activity, uh, which probably another lab cannot do. Uh, so that's a, a couple of, uh, of challenges uh, that uh, need to be taken into account. And um, we are referring here uh, to system level testing. I will explain uh, that in the next slide, what we, are, uh, what we understand uh, under this topic. Uh, but before coming to that, the aim is now to, uh, to have a more formalized um, process for, uh, for uh, preparing the testing uh, itself. Um, this is the uh, basis for knowledge exchange. Uh, we, we looked at other uh, areas uh, where uh, which often apply more formalized uh, procedures, processes there. Uh, one of them, uh, for example, that's uh, uh, automotive domain well established. They have more comp uh, more uh, or, or derived processes uh, or approaches. This is the basic one. This is the so-called uh, V model, uh, which goes from the specification uh, to the coding uh, on the one hand side. So this is the left hand side starting with the specification of the requirements, the high level, uh, hardware software design, then the detailed design, then the, uh, uh, the coding process, uh, program specification and coding. And then if this is being done to do also the validation testing, this is shown uh, represented on the right hand side, starting with debugging uh, unit tests for, for uh, uh, code uh, fragments uh, for programs, then the integration testing, the system level testing, and then at the end also to uh, the user acceptance testing to to see if the uh, user requirements uh, usually coming from the uh, from the users uh, implemented in the correct way, and also uh, that everything what uh, the user uh, wanted to have uh, is uh, at the end available. So this is. Uh, and as I said, uh, there are often more formalized processes used in other domains. They are more and more also used uh, in the power and energy system area, but uh, at least this is uh, our uh, impression feeling that there is room for improvements. And this is also why we uh, developed uh, the Eurigrid uh, holistic validation test procedure. So to have a, a formal process that covers uh, different stages uh, in, the, uh, in the test planning, I have an overview uh, I have a structured approach and I briefly outlined that and now I want to in, uh, um, describe it in more detail. The goal here is to uh, answer these four questions, uh, especially why you do a test, why to test for, what especially you want to test. So referring back to the motivating example with the voltage control on the previous uh, slide, uh, the optimization controller. Uh, what to test for? It means uh, what is the reason for doing the test? It can be a uh, uh, test or um, uh, checking if the uh, algorithm is correctly implemented uh, and how to perform and uh, how to um, implement and perform uh, the test itself. Uh, and for that, we have uh, based on this uh, high level uh, process, the seven steps that I introduced bef briefly before, uh, we have detailed. Uh, the seven steps and also developed uh, corresponding uh, templates for that. So we are not, uh, the, the process covers uh, uh, everything from the test preparation to the test execution, but the test, uh, the templates that I show you uh, in a few minutes are especially uh, made for the test preparation itself. Uh, before co coming to that, uh, we want to clearly distinguish between uh, component and uh, System level testing, when we look at a specific component in, in, from an uh, infrastructure point of view, uh, components are typically the power system uh, components, primary and secondary uh, equipment. Uh, here, for example, a, a PV inverter or generally you know, inverter system is shown that uh, when a component test is outlined uh, in the laboratory with uh, 
PVOA simulator connected supplying DC side of the uh, PV inverter and an AC grid uh, simulator. Uh, <clears throat> This is uh, typically, or that we assume is typically a component level test, where, for example, uh, deep, uh, uh, the maximum power point tracking algorithm is uh, analyzed or tested. The uh, uh, another test could be anti eye landing uh, uh, testing or low voltage ride through tests. So, you typically we have no direct interaction with the system, so it's mainly focused uh, on the uh, car component itself, or often. Um, uh, open loop tests are being uh, used for that uh, component test. And here, typically, especially when you look uh, at uh, related uh, standards uh, covering uh, or addressing uh, this kind of equipment, also testing procedures are already described. So uh, we saw there is not so much need on the component level testing. Um, more imp important uh, in our work was the uh, system level testing where all the different components uh, in a the power system components, the ICD components, or primary secondary equipment, the algorithms uh, need to analyze uh, together. Um, this is with what we typically um, uh, refer to as a system level test. Can be done by using simulations. Uh, on Monday this week, uh, we saw the uh, an approach uh, with the uh, co-simulation, so the coupling of different simulation tools uh, introduced by my colleague Edmund. Uh, <clears throat> but can be also other types of testing. Uh, uh, Philip. Uh, uh, well, will show us some some uh, approaches, some examples also later on. Let's move on. Uh, and um, this is uh, what we uh, what we have uh, developed uh, uh, in the uh, Irrigate projects. We are uh, focused on, on tools and methodologies for the system level testing, uh, where we can also look at the integrated uh, analysis of hardware and software. Uh, where tests can be combined together to multiple domains with this co-simulation. So at the end, the vision is here to uh, have different areas uh, in a uh, integrated or in a cyber-physical energy system uh, where we uh, put together the uh, power system uh, part, the control part, the communication part, the components, and also visualization uh, scatter system, so uh, uh, monitoring uh, diagnosis and so on. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, our vision is to have here yeah, a flexible system where hardware and uh, system components can be put together. So that means uh, it, uh, it matters at the end somehow for sure, but to have a flexible and a car system where you can put uh, simulated uh, as well as uh, real um, physical components, uh, the physical part of a cyber physical system together and then analyze it. Uh, uh, in a holistic uh, manner uh, from a system level point of view. That means, uh, uh, for example, you can do for uh, you said a uh, real control system implemented in an embedded controller, you know, a remote terminal u uh, unit or integrated electronic devices um, with a communicated simulation uh, communication system and then uh, um, simulated emulated power system. Uh, but you can do a similar test also uh, in a uh, it refers more to a hardware a controller hardware in the loop, but Philip will uh, define uh, this type of tests uh, later on. Uh, or you can do also a power hardware in the loop uh, simulation where you have the physical uh, component also PV inverter, the control system uh, together with an emulated uh, uh, power grid. So yeah, we have different ways to uh, couple the different uh, areas also in the design and the validation phase. But before doing that, we need to prepare your test and you need to, uh, to analyze why are you doing, or why you, you need such a setup. And especially this holistic uh, test, uh, testing approach from the Irrigrid project helps you. This is a structured process, uh, so it, uh, provides guidelines to derive uh, from the use cases, uh, the ESCAM modeling, uh, the test objectives, and, it, uh, and to describe a test case uh, for a sp specific uh, uh, application. Uh, if necessary, yeah, you can divide it into different subtasks. So the, the, the whole process uh, helps you to divide, uh, or if, if it's necessary, to divide it in subtests to de derive the experiment specification. So experiment can be a fully uh, uh, experiment in simulation. This can be a hardware in the loop uh, based uh, uh, experiment, or it can be also uh, a laboratory uh, experiment depends on your uh, testing requirements, testing needs. 
And so this this structure process uh, helps you then uh, for preparing the uh, the validation and test uh, setup. Uh, later on, perform the test uh, and analyze also the results. And uh, yeah, we detailed or uh, took uh, uh, when we, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, inputs are use cases, uh, system configurations, scenario system configurations. So uh, we uh, referring to, so we are, this was not the focus of the work. So for, uh, for the system configuration, we're refer referring to SCAM representations. To, uh, Based representation seems it is common information model uh, can be also uh, a representation of a, a power system uh, modeled in sim as an input for the use cases you refer to this uh, ic62559 this uh, use case methodology that i briefly introduced at the beginning um, and then the core uh, development was related to specification of the test cases uh, the uh, experiment, uh, the test specification, and then the experiment specification. So it's a three-level uh, process uh, for identifying uh, the testing uh, needs and uh, also the test setups. When it comes to the test case itself, so this is the first step. Um, we have a test experiment, so we need to analyze what is the purpose of the investigation, why we're doing this uh, test uh, uh, to make an experimental uh, design, uh, just define the test procedures, and uh, uh, we call that this is the, uh, we have developed a corresponding test case template for it. This is uh, for describing the test case. So this independent uh, of uh, any uh, specific uh, test setup. Uh, in the next steps, it's very generic. It's described, so uh, I have some examples later on. Describes just uh, the testing needs, the test uh, matrices. Then a more detailed specification uh, uh, the test case is then uh, split uh, into different uh, test specifications, so they are more detailed, where already specific uh, test configurations are being uh, outlined, and they are then mapped or split uh, down uh, in an experiment specification. So get, you go from a very generic view of it here, testing needs, to a very specific one uh, at the end in the last step in the experiment specification. That can be, for example, a lab setup, that can be a simulation setup, that can be a hardware in the loop setup, um, it could be also um, uh, the, uh, set up in a demo, uh, in a field demo. Um, the whole process, this is the message, helps you to go in a structured way and answering uh, the questions uh, uh, that I showed you previously. So these four questions, why to test, what to test, what to test for, and uh, how to test. Let's see, oh, the, the, the worst thing what you could do is you say, uh, you do uh, uh, implement. Uh, you start with a uh, with a test setup, and you perform the results, uh, perform the tests, uh, but you uh, you don't know exactly why you have <laughs> chosen a specific uh, a specific uh, uh, test setup uh, or test configuration. So our approach here helps you to um, in a structured way to to uh, go step by step uh, from the specification. Of the or from the testing needs to the test uh, and the experiment specification. How is it being done? Uh, as said, uh, we define in the first step uh, to analyze the test needs, the test case, this test case description. For that, uh, we are suggesting to have a uh, very high level view uh, on the problem. So, referring back to the introduction uh, example, so this voltage control. So, here we have uh, in when we uh, identify and define uh, and uh, describe the testing needs test cases. Uh, here, a very uh, uh, simplified representation of the overall problem. So here, uh, just in visualized, uh, we have uh, the need to test the voltage control in a distribution uh, grid, a distribution system, uh, where we have the voltage controller, the inverter, the load in the distribution system. Very, very uh, Simplified to represent it here, but it helps us to analyze what is the system under test. Is it the whole uh, power system? Is it a part of it? Especially for the uh, for this uh, voltage control and the distribution system, it's mainly uh, the distribution system or parts of it, the voltage controller, the uh, linked uh, components, uh, the low steam inverters, but also the ICD equipment. Uh, we see also that here uh, at least uh, three domains uh, are involved, the electric power domain, 
Oh, wait, let's say two uh, the, and the ICT counting domain. Uh, further step is to uh, look what are the objective and investigation. So these are what I especially want to analyze. So this is the voltage controller. This is the object under investigation. So we are not looking at the, uh, ca ca the control of the inverter system. Uh, we are looking at the voltage control algorithm. Uh, and uh, as I already said, the um, uh, domain under, under investigation. But these are mainly the electric power domain and the ICD control uh, domain. The next step, uh, you need to look what are the functions under tests and the functions under investigations. Uh, so here the use case uh, input uh, is helpful from, from the use case description. Um, so do we look, uh, so the, uh, the function under, uh, so the system under test is the voltage controller or energy management. Uh, uh, here, uh, the objective under investigation is to look really at the optimization controller, which is uh, uh, uses state estimations uh, in this, uh, this um, uh, outline here by this simple example, uh, and the optimization controller or the optimization algorithm um, um, itself. Uh, so this is the objective under investigation uh, and the functions uh, under investigations, functions under test uh, are being derived out of this, uh, this investigation. And they, they say, uh, at the end, we want to, to look uh, at the state estimation or the optimization controller, uh, the measurement system, the tap changing controller, the DR uh, controllers. They're relevant for the overall uh, investigation, for sure. You need, you need uh, that also somehow, but especially uh, in this um, uh, motivating examples, we want to look uh, uh, at the uh, voltage controller and especially on these two functions, state estimation function and the optimization function. That help going step by step uh, down, that helps you to uh, really think uh, in detail what you need at the end uh, from the testing uh, system. Next step is uh, you need to, to, to think uh, also what is the purpose of your uh, of your uh, investigation or why you're doing the tests, what to test for. This can be different or that uh, we call it, this is uh, this, uh, a term that describes that uh, is the purpose of, uh, of investigation. And here uh, the reason can be the validation, the overall uh, approach, the verification, uh, the validation if the voltage controller is doing the, the correct thing. Uh, verification uh, means if the uh, voltage control and especially the optimization function and the state estimation function is uh, implemented correctly. So the output uh, outcome is typically fail or pass. Uh, or you can do it probably also for the invest, uh, this, this uh, validation testing for, characteriz for the characterization uh, of a specific component. These are typically um, uh, the, the purpose of investigation, answering uh, what to test for, the question what to test for. Uh, can be also probably all three together, uh, all three purposes of investigations, validation, verification, characterization, or you do a characterization and the validation of, uh, yeah, in this, ex uh, in this uh, box, uh, uh, demand side management controller, uh, is uh, used as an example. So you can, for example, look at the convergence optimization, this is more the validation part. You can look at the performance of the optimization and the realistic conditions, the characterization, how long does it take to come to a uh, solution, and also the accuracy uh, of the state estimation that is a characterization uh, uh, purpose of investigation. So you can see that there are also uh, combinations of it. Good. Um, then from the test objectives, when you know the purpose of investigation, you can also specify the test criteria, uh, test uh, metrics, uh, target metrics uh, um, that you can define. Uh, here we just say in the overall process it's necessary, but we don't uh, uh, suggest here specific methodologies because they are highly uh, depend uh, or highly linked uh, with the uh, uh, the use case, the uh, the energy application that you are looking at. Good. Uh, and then the last step is how to test. So you know now already write uh, a test, uh, what you uh, want to test, and uh, 
for which reason you want to uh, perform the test. The last step is uh, you need to specify and describe how the test is being ca carried out. And here, uh, the, um, the question is here, uh, this is the last step. So going from the uh, test case, this is uh, um, here, uh, the, the process starts uh, um, with the uh, test specification, uh, we detail it uh, down to the test specification and the experiment specification. So we have already uh, identifies the purpose of investigation and the test criteria, and we know the system and the domain categories and the relations. Now we need to sp uh, specify the, uh, the test system, um, which variables uh, or parameters need to be manipulated, what needs to be uh, measured or simulated, depends if it's a hard uh, simulation or hardware uh, related test. Uh, we need to design the test procedure and mapping uh, the test setup to uh, uh, or the test specification to uh, the experiment uh, setup to the, uh, which is covered by the experiment specification. Uh, that can be a lab setup, but it can be a, a set also a simulation based one or a combination of both. So this is uh, the last step. You detail the test setup and map it, map it to your laboratory simulation or uh, physical laboratory based. Going to summarize it, going from a high level view of the testing needs to a very specific description uh, of the test setup before you really uh, uh, start and uh, perform the experiment. This is the last step. Uh, we refined that uh, here. Uh, we uh, uh, say that this is the so called qualification strategy because typically you have one uh, test case, you have a system under test, but you have several test specifications uh, derived, maybe sub-test specification for uh, looking at the sub part, and then yeah, you maybe have also different uh, experiment setups. Uh, you can start probably with a uh, simulation-based experiment, then uh, you move to a hard in the loop-based one, and uh, finally you uh, poor laboratory-based testing. So this is a, a refinement uh, uh, so this disqualification strategy when all the different descriptions uh, in the, by using uh, the three templates uh, that we have developed uh, are available. Uh, to give you a bit uh, more uh, uh, information uh, how that uh, uh, looks in reality, uh, we have uh, put uh, all uh, lots of resources online. One moment, let me put them also here in the chat. Um, <clears throat> That's uh, in the uh, in the Irrigrid 2 project. We collected 25 different test cases uh, that were linked with uh, so-called uh, scenarios. For us, a scenario, uh, or we call the functional scenario, um, um, is based or, or based on a, a system description, the motivation, the use cases, the test cases, the experiment setup, and relevance. Uh, examples you can find here uh, in uh, two. Uh, reports deliverables uh, that are publicly available uh, links uh, in the chat now and also on github uh, from the project uh, we have uploaded all these uh, test cases uh, further uh, current ongoing work is also because all the the, the templates they are um, we started with word-based templates. We also developed some some excel uh, version of it but at the end we wanted to have a bit more um, uh, representation in a, in a uh, readable, uh, in machine readable manner. Uh, we developed uh, an approach. It's currently uh, still in development uh, where we can uh, transform the the word definitions, uh, uh, so Excel uh, based ones, uh, to uh, a machine readable uh, format uh, that can be also then later on visualized in a GitHub page. So this is a, a more process, a tool based uh, uh, processing uh, uh, approach that we're currently working on. Uh, before uh, uh, I finish uh, my part, uh, just uh, to, uh, to give you a bit more concrete uh, example uh, with a functional scenario uh, and select uh, test uh, cases. So um, let's uh, use the uh, sector coupling. Uh, one of the six functional scenarios is related to sector coupling, so that links with the presentation from Edmund on Monday this week with the co-simulation of the sector coupling system. 
Uh, so uh, in a system description, uh, we have uh, part of the functional scenario. We have the electrical and thermal sector coupling uh, with power to heat units. This is uh, uh, the, uh, the goal to be analyzed. Uh, the motivation can be a massive rollout of power to X components and its impact on the electrical domain. Uh, use cases are uh, electrical and thermal network optimization. Uh, the test case, uh, the link test case is then the verification of improved self consumption of renewable energy sources uh, in a coupled heat and power network uh, using power to heat. Um, and the experimental setup is, for example, a co simulation of the electric boiler activation uh, for ex uh, excess power consumption with uh, proportional controllers. Uh, so that links. Uh, to the uh, uh, lecture on Monday, I said that uh, where Edmund uh, detailed explained uh, what uh, tools and approaches we have developed to uh, co-simulate that, uh, and then also uh, relevance is included. So we have here uh, uh, to sum it up in a approach that helps us to. Uh, uh, Think from the beginning on, uh, well, guides you uh, through the overall, uh, uh, so the whole um, specification design engineering process, and also the, the validation, starting uh, from the motivations, uh, which kind of uh, domains you analyze, uh, deriving the, uh, the uh, use and test cases, uh, uh, and uh, all together of, uh, forms this functional scenario. Uh, as said, we have collected uh, quite a lot of test cases uh, in the projects. They are publicly visible uh, uh, in the uh, resources that I put here in the chat. Uh, um, they are based on uh, six functional scenarios. Uh, and um, at the end, uh, we have the Irrigate 2 project here, quite a lot of different uh, test cases. and. Uh, from different areas uh, targeting different uh, domains, uh, domain investigation, uh, analyzing this different test phenomena, as well as uh, which type of, uh, uh, of assessment is carried out and which test system components is, uh, is uh, being needed. And we uh, we felt that yeah, it's quite, quite a lot of information and we want to categorize uh, that also. And therefore we uh, came out with the uh, approach or with the idea of so-called test case profiles to uh, have also an approach to categorize uh, in a bigger activity in a bigger project. Um, we uh, defined all the uh, test cases using this uh, Eric Ritualistic testing approach, where the uh, holistic test case uh, descriptions uh, with the three templates, the test cases, uh, the test uh, specification, and the experiment specification is being used. We assigned to each uh, test case also relevant keywords, and they helped us uh, for defining characteristics of the technical areas. Um, also to uh, to have a better representation of all the testing uh, needs. So, so here a bit represented in this uh, in this matrix that the different functional scenarios and the linked test cases addressing different uh, different topics. This is just for our Irrigate project, but it can be uh, for sure adopted uh, for other uh, needs as well. So the, the outcomes here were for this test case profiles that we find really helpful um, is that um, we have this, uh, selected these four uh, keywords because they were of uh, interest for our project, but for sure can be uh, adapted for other problems. Uh, there are other uh, dimensions uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, of interest. And then we uh, derived the, the so-called test case profiles, which is uh, this representations uh, where we have test cases that fit uh, into this um, uh, this representation where uh, they have commonalities uh, in these uh, four uh, dimensions. Uh, domain investigation, phenomenon under test, type of assessment, and the test says, uh, system itself. It was quite helpful, if uh, especially then when you have uh, lots of different uh, test cases which you need to deal with. Uh, so to sum it up, this uh, test case profile concept, uh, this is from uh, our point of view, uh, a really helpful tool that can be helpful for for different activities. So we identified here basically four different uh, areas, but probably can be much more. Um, it can be helpful when a beginner starts entering a new domain and looks at the validation testing needs. 
have here a structured way to uh, uh, to categorize and to have an overview about different uh, existing test cases. It can be helpful for uh, for benchmark identification for common uh, test cases that fall in the specific profile uh, for project uh, case studies, uh, for presenting them, uh, putting uh, test cases into context, which have commonalities, um, and also probably for uh, aligning infrastructure capabilities with org web. So that means uh, you have uh, future testing needs uh, described in test cases, but you don't have uh, a specific uh, test infrastructure yet, or only a part of it. It can be also helpful using this test case uh, profiles to uh, identify uh, the most uh, uh, important uh, infrastructure upgrading, uh, upgrading needs. That's a brief overview about the test case, our uh, test preparations uh, uh, with these uh, methods that I briefly outlined. Uh, feel free to have a closer look in our developments in the documentation as well as the online uh, descriptions of uh, existing test cases uh, that uh, in our point of view helps you uh, in order to identify the testing needs, the testing, uh, uh, testing setups before you uh, make any uh, implementations in a specific uh, setup. Are there any comments, questions related to it? Which we could answer now. Otherwise we can move on with Philip's part. See any further comments? So, uh, well, uh, there's one question, are there testing validation needs recognized in the regulatory documents? Uh, partly, uh, uh, but our feeling uh, was more and that refers back to what we uh, uh, refer to as component uh, level tests as in the component related activities is much more given on the system level. In, it's at least my uh, experience, uh, there are not so many uh, concrete uh, information given in regulatory documents. But maybe that that uh, changes now because uh, we are moving more and more this towards uh, cyber physical energy systems. I think this is also a need to reflect it there. But I hope that uh, provides an answer to the question and uh, if there are no additional questions currently, uh, I will hand over to Philip. Philip, I think you're muted. Uh, I cannot, cannot hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yep. No, no it's working. Good. So I have a problem. As always, it needs to be included. Uh, yeah, so I will continue with, uh, uh, with the fourth section here, which is advanced validation and testing methods. So the idea here is to connect with what Thomas already presented. So basically the preparation part that he presented and go into a bit more detail on then exactly how to execute the test. So what methods are there? Uh, so I will go through some uh, standard types of tests that we do and then that, that's usually done starting with uh, what's done on component level and how we can extend that into system level testing. And also going then more towards cyber physical energy systems and what is required there. How can we uh, reuse these testing methods there or what's missing and, and what do we need to do there? So first of all, this is an introductionary slide from my side also. So Thomas already had quite a lot of motivation slides in the beginning. So I just have one here to, to bring back to the point what I want to focus on here in my part. So uh, uh, today in power system designing and validation, you have a quite traditional design and validation process starting with initiation. Then you have specification design phase go on with the development and that validation deployment. So it's it's a, it's a quite traditional process, typically this V model that Thomas presented uh, and it's characteristic by a lot of manual engineering validation steps. Going into agile methods, they are not really common yet, and uh, uh, this is something that, that's missing. And commonly also you have these separate processes for power system engineering and ICT system. And 
uh, yeah, we see, for example, if you have, this is just one example that we had in a, in a project of ours uh, where we were collaborating with a, with a um, manufacturer of SCADA systems and we were talking about implementation of a human machine interface or an HMI for a substation and they uh, just mentioned that you have up to 7,000 7, signals there that you want to configure and test. And the traditional approach is that you do this manually uh, in different steps. So you do that in, in the, on the manufacturing side, so in the factory, and then you also do that on site. So it's a manual approach, a lot of different signals to configure and test. And, and this can take up to several weeks when you do that uh, uh, traditional approach. But let's say you now want to do the same. So you want to have this digitalization also for all of the secondary substations and not only for the uh, and primary substations uh, and we'll know that they are many more of these and we cannot do the same traditional approach there this will then take forever until we have a digital uh, system so that's one motivation that we are uh, dealing with here and well let's take one step back for for uh, uh, before we go into to system level testing and validation. So uh, when you talk about validating modern power system components, there are a lot of different methods that are available to us. Uh, so of course you can start, as we see on the left hand side here, uh, using offline simulation. It's typically also done when you are developing new concepts. And once you have more mature product, you can go into so-called controller hardware in the loop, uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in the next slides. Uh, and then once you have done that, you can go into a power hot wind loop also to have even better test coverage. And since it's only a component that you want to test, it's quite easy to, to go further and have laboratory tests. You test it in the lab, uh, as Thomas mentioned before. And you can also test that quite easily in the field without disturbing uh, your main system there. So we have quite a lot of options here. And as you can see, we have then quite good test coverage, so to say, in the end, we can test a lot of different cases before we actually say that oh, now this product is finished and we can actually deploy this in the field. Uh, so let's go back to these. Uh, sorry, so let's let's take a look at especially these controller hardware and loop and power hardware and loop and what that actually means. And so I will say a few words on especially what we are talking about when we uh, mentioned these tools. So let's start with controller hardware in a loop. It's, uh, uh, I would say, a, a quite common way nowadays to test controllers. So the whole idea is that you develop your controller on a, on a dedicated controller hardware. So it, it will be developed and deployed on the, on the hardware that will then be installed in the system. And you can, test this by connecting it to a simulated uh, uh, simulated version of your system. So in the picture here, this is some application or control that we want to test. And in this case, it's doing something, controlling something maybe in a, in a, in a power system. And instead of connecting it directly with a, with a, with a power system, we test it with a simulated uh, version here. And in order to interface that, you can either use ICT interfaces, uh, like traditional communication interfaces, Modbus, IC61850, for example, or you can also connect it with uh, analog and, uh, and, and digital uh, inputs and output signals. So with this idea, the whole idea here is that you actually develop your controller as it would be in the field, and you can test it against a simulated version of the system. So with this, you can check a lot of things that uh, uh, before you actually deploy it in the field, so you can check communication works properly. Uh, are there any issues that you didn't see when you simulated or tested it? Uh, these are things that you can then see in this in this case here. And uh, a further option is also to use a so-called uh, power hardware loop. So you can extend this controller hardware loop with a power hardware loop test. Uh, that's depicted here uh, on the on the bottom here with this extra interface here, and this is then not a communication signal, but you are actually connecting it 
uh, with a power interface. Uh, so, for example, if this is, and I mean, it says application invert, this could be, for example, an inverter that also has some software on it, but it has also a power interface. And in order to connect that with your simulation, then you need some some power source in between here or power interface so that can be then, for example, an AC or DC source uh, that that allows you to to connect it with your simulation. But the idea is the same. So you want to uh, validate your controller or your application uh, by using a simulated version of your system. And then you can also have like it's depicted here. So you have some combinations. So you have both controller hardware loop together with uh, power hardware loop uh, with the whole idea to have uh, validate interaction between your system, uh, your your application here, uh, and, and key components in the grid. And then we have another option also, which uh, uh, I want to show here because it's something that we want to. I want to, I will talk about that later on and, and you will see how we use that. And that is uh, what we call here software in the loop. Uh, and the idea here is that you test the same application as you did before. But in this case, it's not uh, deployed on its dedicated hardware. It's running. Uh, either it can be containerized version of it or it's running on somewhere else. Uh, but it's still connected to the uh, to the real time simulation using a communication protocol, and from the application point of view, there is not really any difference uh, of if it's running on the on the dedicated hardware or on a emulated hardware in this case. And the whole idea with this purpose is that uh, you can test multiple of these applications, so you can instead of just uh, deploying one application on one controller here, you can actually deploy uh, hundreds and thousands of these and see how they uh, then interact with the system. Uh, and you see how the system, you can also see how the system reacts then. Uh, you can do this quite easily with different grids, so you can automate this process much better than uh, if you have it on a dedicated hardware. Uh, and you have certain applications that you probably can only test in this case, and that could be, for example, optimize, optimization algorithms, distributed types of applications. Uh, this can then be validated in this case. And I will come back later to why this is then really important for cyber physical uh, energy systems as well. Um, so when we talk about system level validation methods, they are similar. Uh, but they, uh, they, uh, there, there are some differences, and, and there are some, some, some key aspects that I want to highlight here. Uh, so one thing, they, they are based on component tests. So we are still uh, talking about this. So when we talk about component tests, here we are looking directly on what the component does. How does this react? And as already mentioned, we have here this hardware in the loop uh, uh, methods. Uh, for example, the power hardware loop, controller hardware loop methods that we can use here, but we can also connect it directly in the lab. And if we then zoom out, so to say, and also want to do a um, small system test. So what we want to look at here is uh, system response uh, in the vicinity of the controller or, or of the component. So we still have our hardware in the loop uh, possibilities. We have lab tests. But here also this controller software in the loop or the, the software in the loop tests come into play uh, by using real time simulation. And uh, just so you know what we're talking about here. So for this year, maybe it's more related to centralized control concepts. It's like up to 10 controllers that we want to test in this case. But if we zoom out even more on what we call large scale system tests, uh, what we really want to look at there is then the interaction between not only just the component and, and the system, but between all software frameworks or uh, controller, so a fleet of controllers, so to say, so multiple controllers running. But it can also be complex software optimization algorithms uh, and how that then interacts with the system. So 
in this case, it's not really possible anymore to use these classical hardware in the loop concepts like controller hardware in the loop, power hardware in the loop, because we are looking at so many controllers at the same time. And we have to fall back to this one concept of the software in the loop where we deploy these controllers uh, on an emulated hardware, so to say. But if we do that, then we can look at large scale systems. So we can go here up to uh, hundreds and thousands of controllers that that we are that we want to validate. So this is a, a core concept that we uh, want to use also for uh, cyber physical systems. Because we see here we have a, a very tight integration and a very. Very uh, so it's not. In this case, it's not the power system itself that, that has the main focus, but we have this interaction between ICT software system, especially if we have this large software frameworks that we want to test. Uh, and the more interlinked the system stability and the, the system functionality is with the software, we cannot just separate these and test them uh, on their own. We need to be able to test them together. So, uh, so far, I'm talking about I've been talking about classical power system testing methods, uh, uh, and what we now also want to see is how can we then connect uh, the two worlds a bit more with each other. So, uh, I'm talking about software frameworks here. We all know that there are software testing methods, uh, and in the next slides, I want to show some core aspects of software testing methods that that we think can really help. Uh, also the design and validation of cyber physical energy systems. Uh, so modern software and testing and validation methods uh, are, uh, you probably know a lot of them already. Uh, as for us in the power system domain, it's uh, crucial also to test software before it's deployed. And this is just one example of different testing methods you hear, so you have Functional testing methods, so classical unit testing uh, that uh, probably all of us know. Um, but this can also be extended then to integration testing, uh, system testing within the software, acceptance testing. So this is then the alpha beta testing, how the user accepts it. But that's uh, only one part, and you also have non functional uh, tests. So how is security is the software performance and so on? Uh, so there are a lot of uh, different things here that we can test on the software side. Uh, and furthermore, what's also commonly available nowadays in software testing are uh, agile testing methods uh, or agile project management methods in general uh, that I would say are not so adopted yet within the power system domain where the whole emphasis is on, on iterative development and collaboration. Uh, and integrating testing within this. So uh, just a quick overview of what Agile methods are about. So the whole idea is that you have a plan on what you want to implement and within certain, a certain time you iterate, test and develop uh, new, fe new features that at the end uh, should be usable. And within uh, so this collaboration is, is a core part here so you have feedback directly here that you can uh, that you can loop back and reiterate here so the whole idea is that you can uh, react much faster to requirements from customers but it can also be other requirements that you need to fulfill so uh, there can be new uh, regulations and things like this so the whole idea is that you need to be able to react much faster and uh, I think we can see this already in the power system domain also that this is necessary. Uh, so a couple of years back, there was the 50.2 hertz problem in, in Germany where a lot of inverters needed to be updated because uh, they caused problems when they all switched off at 50.2 hertz uh, uh, in the grid, uh, the frequency. Um, and this is a typical case where you have to react quite fast and you need to be able to reiterate uh, and update uh, 
your applications and do that in a, in a timely manner, I would say. Another thing that's common in software development is so-called continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, where um, this involves, I would say, automatic testing, uh, integrating code changes, and then automatically deploying your code uh, and ensuring that the software is running uh, on the system. So, um, yeah, this is a, a typical figure of how this uh, works. So when you have a new piece of code that you want to add, you commit that. Maybe this is merged with related code. Uh, and when you do that, you automatically have tests that run. So you have unit tests, for example. Uh, first, it's build, of course. So you compile your code, and then you have tests running, different tests. Uh, if the tests succeed, you can then go uh, continue to your continuous delivery pipeline where you review the code, you stage it, and then you uh, deploy it in the production environment. And common tools like GitHub, GitLab, they, they offer these opportunities, so you can integrate this very easily there. And this is, I think, quite good examples of, of how we envision that also the design and development and validation of cyber physical energy systems could look like. So when you have new functions uh, that you want to develop, you have this process somehow where you have automatic testing and maybe automatic deployment at the end. So uh, what we have been working on at the IT uh, is a process for this. So to show our vision for how that works, uh, the whole idea is that it starts at this point where Thomas already started today. So we have some use case design and requirements that we want to do. We have some some application that we want to develop that can either be uh, well in the first stage uh, that can be just prosa documents written somewhere, or you have some diagrams, and you turn that into in the first step. Uh, 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 format that's I would say a bit more formal so you have your smart grid architecture model that can help you with this you have your use case methodologies but it can also be this holistic testing description method uh, from the Aerogrid project um, that gives you more formal descriptions and, and especially structured descriptions of how you want to implement this uh, and what we see then is it's uh, uh, this, I think, links back to the question what this power system automation language is, this PSAL, and how this relates to this. So the whole idea is that then with this PSAL, which is a, a really formal uh, language, and also it's a machine readable language, uh, you can actually formalize all of these things that you have uh, written down in your uh, use case documents and test case documents. And the whole idea is then that you do that in, in the specification phase, and then you can reuse this in your different uh, uh, in your different phases. So you can see that as a something of a single source of truth, truth where you uh, this is your main basis for all the, the following steps. So you can use that for the engineering for uh, on the one hand side, uh, generating code and configurations. Uh, you can use it in the validation phase, uh, generating simulation models and configurations for your simulation and validations. Uh, and finally, also uh, use that in the last phase of what do you need to adapt in order to be able to deploy this into uh, onto certain platforms. So this is, I would say, our vision and how we uh, want to be able to do uh, engineering and validation for cyber physical energy systems. And uh, this, what I want to present here, is uh, an automated uh, testing framework that we had developed at AIT. Uh, and uh, today I will give an overview of what we 
what we what we have developed and I want to show you the main highlights of it and, and, and the main ideas behind of it. But I want to uh, also uh, already now uh, say that tomorrow there will be a, a much more detailed presentation about this, uh, uh, which will be given by two other colleagues at AIT. Uh, they will give you much more details about how this works and what tools are behind this and uh, how this works in, in more detail. But uh, I want to give an overview of it and, and show you what we can do with it. And what we call it, we call it uh, uh, the automated cyber physical testing and validation framework. And the whole idea is that you can do this automated system validation using this controller software in the loop. So what, what's the, the main idea? So the main idea is that when uh, an external developer is developing a new feature or a new application, they can package these source files and add this to a repository somewhere. Uh, and the whole idea is, so you see there's this uh, bubble here, the cloud internet. So it doesn't have to be on the same premises as, as our testing framework, it can be somewhere else. Uh, but the whole idea is that they, they, they package their software there uh, and they can then define experiments and tests uh, for example, using this PISA language. And then uh, with a trigger, they can uh, trigger the validation pipeline uh, on our side. Uh, and what this does is that it retrieves basically these specifications here on this side uh, and use these to, uh, uh, first of all, deploy a scenario. So what's also included here is uh, a description of the scenario that we want to test. So that can be, for example, the grid that we want to simulate. Uh, what's also included there is the application. Where is it located? How does it connect with the components in the grid? So this is then deployed based on the on the on the design specifications. And at the same time, we have our own internal servers here. So we have our real-time system, real-time simulator, OpalRT real-time simulator that allows us to simulate uh, the physical network, so the power system network in real time. And we have our internal servers that allow us to deploy then these software containers, uh, uh, multiple instances of these. So that's the first step. And then one, once that has been done. We have the predefined tests uh, that we then run uh, using a test manager. So these can be, uh, so what we're focusing here are on real-time tests, I have to say that, uh, but so that but the test can be multiple tests. Uh, it could be uh, theory parallel tests, uh, although that's not supported yet because we don't have enough of the, of the real-time simulators. Uh, but that's taken care of by the test manager, and in the end, they, it collects the, the generated data, uh, and based on on descriptions here, we can then also generate reports and data files. That's then again uh, sent back to the to the developer, and they can then use that for uh, for the review uh, and for the staging and the, and the further steps. So, how does this look like in a bit more Detailed case here, so we have a, uh, a validation pipeline that we developed that allows us to couple the development pipeline from a software. So basically the software CI pipeline with our validation pipeline. Uh, and yeah, the, the idea is that we have an external developer that is developing some software and that's connected then with uh, a test service provider that uh, basically provides this ACTV that uh, that I presented on the slide before. So as I already said, uh, when a new commit is pushed, we have the classical CI steps here. So we have building the code, we run tests, different tests, uh, we can generate documentation here. And once those have been successfully finished, we have a, a intermediate step here where we uh, where basically the, the external developer is triggering the test service. Uh, it 
packages its, its software in, in different containers and then triggers the, the, the test service uh, from the test service provider. Uh, this again retrieves the, the, the packaged software together with uh, uh, with the Docker Compose here, another configuration file set we need in order to set up the test. And then we have these uh, intermediate steps here where we first stage the scenario that means deploying the, the simulation models, deploying the, uh, the Docker uh, containers that we need we then run, um, we, uh, we run the tests, and then we generate the reports and we send these back to the to the to the external developer. Uh, in this case, we developed this in, in GitLab. So what we do here is that we actually generate artifacts here from the results so they can then be easily downloaded by the by the external developer here. So for the external developer within uh, the GitLab, it's just another step in their pipeline to actually trigger this uh, more complicated system system tests. So I want to show you one example of uh, how we did this. So we did this together with Fernando for ESA. Um, and they were acting in this case as external developers, so they are developing an energy management system. And the IT here was the test service provider. So in the use case, we have an energy management system, as you see here on the figure, uh, that controls EV charging. Basically, you have a wall box here connected to an EV, uh, and it controls this um, together with a control box here based on control signals received from the DSO. So basically, the, the idea is that if a DSO notices that there are issues in the grid, it can issue control signal to the uh, through the smart meter gateway to the control box and the EMS that uh, please limit the power uh, on the uh, on the point of connection between the household and the grid. Um, and in this test scenario, we wanted to test both these two, so both the control box algorithm and the EMS. Uh, and the uh, challenges behind it now is that we have on the one hand side, you need some expert grid knowledge in order to perform the test. So it's not so, uh, it's not um, for a software developer, it's not, I would say, straightforward to just implement these themselves. So what we need here is collaboration between the external developer, which is Ron Hofer in this case, and AIT as a test service provider. And we use this ACT framework uh, in order to address the complexity of this. So, uh, what we wanted to do in this case was on the one hand to test that, that the whole setup works, but also to validate the algorithm here and see how this then also impacts the grid. So I will show you some uh, some results here just uh, before we do that. Uh, let's have a, another look at the validation setup. So what we used here was the secret low voltage uh, benchmark network, and we simulated that uh, in our Opala T real time simulator. So it has eight nodes here. So each node was representing a household. So in each household, we had one control box and one EMS running. Uh, uh, and they could then uh, change uh, the power uh, needed or the power uh, consumed in each node, depending on the DSO limits. So what we will see then, uh, so once this was triggered, the test was the following, so that a DSO published a new control set point, and we wanted to see that the control box could respond to this DSO limitation, and then it's the, uh, the, the, um, the purpose of the EMS to adjust controllable loads within the household to uh, adhere to these constraints set by the DSO. Uh, and we recorded all the signals uh, exchanged among, with, first of all, within the grid, but also within between the, the control box and the EMS. Um, and these were then the different steps that we did. So this relates to this pipeline that we developed. So the external developer is in this case that they, they committed a new, uh, a new, a new version of their of their. Uh, EMS and control box, 
Uh, once this was done, we had the, the traditional CI steps. Uh, so we, they were built, uh, unit tests and integration tests were done. Then we had this trigger where they triggered our validation framework. Uh, so once we received the trigger here, we loaded the scenarios. This was uh, a scenario that was predefined here by, by EC in this case uh, together with us. So this was this big low voltage grid that, that we used. So we loaded this scenario uh, and could uh, load that into our simulator. And then once we had loaded all of the things, prepared everything, we run the tests uh, where we wanted to check that the power limits uh, were uh, correctly um, adhered to and that there were not no line congestion. So here you see one of the res or you see the results from one of the nodes uh, where we have this uh, uh, the EMS and the control box deployed uh, just to show you quickly here. So we have two steps here. So the first uh, is here this event number one where the DSO sets the first limitation. This is this the blue line here is the limit and we see that uh, the actual measured uh, power it fluctuates around this but it's uh, goes down here and then in the second event you have a new limit by the by the DSO and uh, you see here the red line following this uh, and then at some point you have the power consumed by the household going under here but you will see then here that there are no limitations on the on the on the uh, on the appliances here so here you see what the EMS actually controls so uh, the appliances uh, in the household are not really used. It mainly uses the the electric vehicle here, the loading on that or the charging of that. So we see that the green line would be the normal charging of the EV. Uh, so this is then limited in the first steps here. But then once the uh, the actual load on uh, on the point of coupling goes below this limit here, uh, we follow the full charging uh, what is possible here. Uh, so these results were then collected together uh, and sent back to the external developer. They can then review these results and see if, if it's necessary to adapt something and run the whole process again. Or if it's everything is working, then the idea would be to stage this and then deploy it to the EMS and the control box that they are then using in the field. So that was uh, one example scenario of how we can use these automated tools for designing and validating uh, cyber physical energy systems. So we have now reached our conclusions. Um, yeah, so going back again to what Thomas talked about, we see here a uh, large scale rollout of smart grid and energy solutions. Uh, we all think and know that this will come in the future and we need to be able to adapt to that. There are tools and methods available, but we also need to apply them. Uh, um, and we see that there are need for development of system level engineering and validation procedures. Uh, and this is important. So going from the specification, how can you specify your different steps? How can you specify how you want to validate your components? Uh, it's uh, starting with that and then follows the different tools and methods that you can then actually use. So we see here the simulation based methods, uh, hardware in the loop approaches and lab based methods. They are promising or becoming certain shortcomings. Uh, they come from from these component testing approaches here, but we can reuse a lot of these also for the for the system level validation. Uh, but there are still things missing, so we need to, on one hand side, uh, update our research infrastructures for this. Uh, education training is also a key factor. Uh, but also, as I mentioned now, here we have this, uh, the whole idea with the cyber physical energy systems is that we need to see this as a as one system. So we need a cyber physical approach basically for the design and validation. So. On the one hand side, we see the need here to incorporate agile methods in order to react 
uh, or to better react on, on, on upcoming changes and develop new ways to actually combine methods from software development as this continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, with classical power system engineering methods. So uh, on top of this, we also need automation. We see here the more complex the systems are, the more interactions you have between components. It is not possible to set these tests up manually and do things as we did before. Uh, we will not have the possibilities or the time, the resources to do that. Uh, furthermore, we see that uh, automation here can uh, minimize human errors and drastically reduce manual efforts. So for this case here uh, that I showed where we tested this uh, control software from Fraunhofer together with uh, our testing infrastructure. Uh, we did some some initial evaluation. So with the validation pipeline that we developed here, uh, once you have a new uh, feature that you want to test, uh, the actual time you need to run the tests, uh, as we have done it here, uh, it's around one and a half hour where we have this one hour tests uh, in between. So it's an automatic process and it's a very short time to actually getting the results. Uh, if you would do that with a manual setup, but partly using this uh, automated uh, testing environment, you would have a much longer configuration phase. Uh, it would mean you would have to develop your code, uh, build it, uh, send code to the testing infrastructure, uh, the testing uh, provider, they would manually have to integrate this into their uh, validation uh, systems. Uh, uh, and we expect here a much longer time, so you can talk about uh, five hours for that, where you then have one hour test uh, included here. If you go one step further, so to say, and you only have a manual setup. Uh, we're talking about days, so this can be a, a week where you have to set everything up. Uh, uh, and you have a lot of the different processes as here, but you have to, all, have to do all of them manually. And if you would actually say you want to do a field test of this, uh, you would have a much longer time. Uh, we're talking about weeks here, if not months, to set something like this up. So I think with, with this approach, of course, you cannot say that you can completely uh, substitute these uh, uh, software in the loop tests with a field test, but a lot of the things that you want to look at, you can look here in a, in a, in a software in the loop test. Uh, and with this validation pipeline, you can figure out a lot of things before you then actually deploy this and run tests in a pilot or in a field. So I think with this approach, you can really reduce the effort that it takes, and this can uh, really increase the adoption of new technologies and uh, and allow for for new methods to be deployed in the field in a much more timely manner. So that's uh, the conclusions. We have some uh, future challenges also that we see. Uh, uh, so we are not done, I would say. So investigations of cyber physical energy systems uh, is only starting, I would say. Uh, so what we looked at today is basically this lower part here. So you have a to grid together with uh, controllers running. But if you also want to look at more, uh, the whole system architecture, so basically also including OT and IT infrastructure. On top of that, you need even more uh, further developed approaches uh, and uh, if you then also say, I want to be able to uh, run digital twins for this, you need new methods uh, to create your digital twins. So basically, uh, how can we generate cyber physical uh, system digital twins? So if I want to test some things here, uh, how can I generate digital twins for the validation and engineering purposes? Uh, we need more new tools and uh, methodologies for this. And also another important part I think here is we need to extend hardware and software resources for this. So this is not something that we can just uh, create and run on, on our laptops. There is a real need for uh, um, 
calculation infrastructure uh, and real-time simulators for this. So with this, that's, uh, we have reached the end of our presentation. Uh, we'll just stop here at the references. So these are some of previous work that we have done. And I think we're open for questions. And thanks, Philip, uh, for your insights, providing the insights of your work. Uh, we have one question that uh, goes towards uh, tools. Uh, for a newcomer with, uh, working with cyber attacks on energy market, what kind of software simulation tools you can suggest to test without hardware involvement? Any, uh, any suggestions, Philip? Uh, well, for cyber attacks, I uh, I have to admit I'm not the, the expert on that. That's not something that, that we are uh, working on. When it comes to simulation tools, uh, there are uh, good simulation tools. So if it cannot, so the, of course the, the simulation tools that we are using, OpenRT and these tools, they cost a lot of money, but there are other tools. So uh, I know Python Power, for example, is something that you can use. Uh, they're a good starting grid. Um, and uh, those are tools that do not cost uh, anything and are a good starting point. Thanks, Philip. Are there any other questions? Um, maybe one thing also <laughs> to, to extend on that. So uh, uh, also I want to uh, 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 highlight also that tomorrow my colleagues will talk a little bit more about the actual tools that we're using. So, so the more detailed tools behind that. So if you want to know more about exactly what tools we're using there from, so the whole, uh, the whole, uh, let me go back again to the, uh, to the slide. Um, so exactly what tools we use for developing this uh, I would recommend you to look at uh, the, either tune in to the lecture tomorrow uh, or look at the slides afterwards because here you will have much more details about the tools that we're using. So we're basing a lot of our work on open source tools. Uh, so, so there you can get more insights on, on this also. There's another question. When one works cyber attacks, how much delay in information we can make it? Uh, it as benchmark. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm not completely sure what the question is. The question is about how long the delays are or what type of applications we can run here. So for the real-time simulation, we're talking about milliseconds. So we can communicate here with, uh, we can run applications uh, that communicate uh, within milliseconds uh, if it's, Below that, uh, that's we cannot use the approach uh, shown here. Then you need to use more uh, real. You need to interface in a different way. So what we're in, we're interfacing here with traditional communication protocols. It's based on on Redis in in uh, in our solution here, uh, and then we can run this uh, tests uh, with uh, milliseconds uh, round trip time. Thank you very much for answering that uh, question as well. So I don't see any other questions, then I think we can now uh, close the uh, uh, lecture part three today. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope that you find uh, some of the tools are, uh, helpful for your work uh, and you're kindly invited to join us tomorrow. Uh, in the last part, in the past four, where our colleagues uh, Katalin Gavilukta and Dennis Vettoretti uh, will give you more insights about the, the, the tools that we're using for the large scale uh, analysis validation of cyber physical energy applications. Thank you very much. And as I said, uh, until the, uh, after the end of the, uh, of the lecture series, uh, you will receive uh, all the training material, the recordings, as well as the uh, uh, slides, the presentation slides from all four parts uh, together. Many thanks for joining. Uh, have a nice day and hope to see all of you also tomorrow. And thanks yeah. again also, Philip, uh, for your contribution. Yes, yeah, thank you also from my side. Thank you, everyone, for listening.